I've worked in in a number of, um, I guess, warlike situations, um, but without a doubt, working in Afghanistan um, was the most dangerous area that I worked. This one was probably um, harder than many others because uh, I, having worked previously in Afghanistan and um, knowing the not only me knowing the dangers, but my family knowing the dangers um, that um, you know my wife and family weren't exactly thrilled with the idea. So it was um, a much harder um, farewell, and knowing that um, that I'd actually be embedded with the, the military, um, and there's been a lot of coverage, obviously, about um, about casualties. So um, yeah, it's just departing on this occasion was was probably harder than um, some of the others. Being there previously um, in 2009, it was quite a quite a contrast because during during that period I wasn't um, embedded with the the military. I was um, a uh, consultant working with the Afghan um, Human Rights Commission, um, and as such, I didn't have any. Um, uh, security to the extent that I had whilst embedded with the military. Um, I worked in Kabul, which um, is a um, quite a different um, environment than um, Uruzgan province, which is quite a um, remote and um, underdeveloped area. Um, and I'd also worked in the north in Mazari Sharif, um, which at that time was a much more permissive area uh, to work and um, uh, very little um, risk at that time um, and I had a, a lot of freedom of movement and was able to actually visit um, Afghans in their homes and, and um, go for meals with um, the Afghan staff that I work with in, in restaurants and cafes and uh, so that was a, a really great way to get an insight into you know the real Afghanistan. When I was um, in um, Uruzgan province on, on this occasion. Um, in, first of all, I was in Tarrant County in the, in the multinational base there, um, but only for a short time, and I was deployed to a forward operating base in the, the um, Chora district in um, forward operating base Mirawise. The view of, of from the, uh, the, um, the Chora Valley, um, even though it's a very stark um, with the the mountains and uh, devoid of uh, vegetation, it's um, they're very uh, very high, obviously, you know, much higher than the mountains in in Australia, and um, in winter, you know, covered in snow, and then you've got the contrast with the uh, rivers and um, canals, what, what they call the green zone, where it's very lush and um, the um, agriculture is is highly developed there and. Um, Lots of uh, you know apricot trees in flower, um, obviously poppies. My role in um, in Uruzgan province was as a stabilisation advisor, embedded within the the provincial reconstruction team. And one of the roles I had was to uh, mentor the district government officials in in government in governance. Sorry, um, to show them how to um, project manage um, some of the development activities that we were um, starting to um, bring to the district so that they could actually uh, learn in real time how to run projects, um, not just us delivering everything to them, but to mentor them how to do that. Anti-corruption was um, one of the main areas, was to um, bring in a sense of transparency with projects for the um, open tendering um, to, to ensure that um, the uh, projects were shared out evenly um, within the, both the villages and the tribes, but also to ensure that, that projects um, such as uh, water, fresh drinking water and um, schooling, health clinics, were actually getting to the, the villages that actually needed them rather than just everything going to the more powerful or connected um, tribal or villages, which um, had been a problem in the past. Delivering um, development and, and projects in any environment is al always difficult. In, in Afghanistan, it's, it's 
more difficult than most places that I've worked in in Asia and Africa, in that uh, the tribal and and village um, connections are, uh, are so complex. It's even if after being there, I'd been there seven or eight months. Um, there is no way that I could say that I truly understood the the complexities and and the interconnectivity between um, uh, tribes and uh, within within the the district, let alone the connectivity between tribes right up to Kabul and the and and the the government. So it, it's it's critical to um, to ensure that. Um, that you, you're not being part of the problem and, and bringing favouritism to people with, um, and putting them in, in a greater position of power. In, in development, one of the, uh, the biggest mistakes that I've seen around the world is, um, is the failure to engage communities um, and to form true partnerships. It's very easy to um, deliver aid to deliver what you or, or your government or your organisation thinks that a community needs. Um, you know, spending money is very easy. Um, the harder thing is to actually engage with a community and work with a community to ensure that whatever aid that, and development that you're bringing to them is what they actually need, what they want, and that they're going to utilise. Working in um, transitional environments, countries that moving from war to non-warlike situations or war, war-like situations like Afghanistan, is always, um, you've always got a, uh, an atmosphere where people will do anything um, to survive and people have to do anything to survive. Um, we were constant being, constantly being lobbied by um, certain tribal leaders who wanted the, the canals to start um, in, in areas of their control. Um, you know, they'd come up with, with a number of stories as, as to why, but you know, once you um, looked, dug deeply into them and looked at the, the way that the villages were situated, that it was quite often a way for them to actually gain control of, of the water and, and water is the key um, ingredient to life in Afghanistan, especially in the, the uh, areas like Oregon which are very dry and um, have very hot summers and uh, that water can be very seasonal. So if someone can gain control over water, it, that means they, they can essentially um, starve out other tribes and other villages. In a place like Afghanistan where war has been a, uh, a way of life and different um, groups have come and gone uh, and they see the they see those people who are there um, as just part of another transition um, it's it's very difficult to to gain trust we were um, sort of like an island within um, Afghanistan or the the, the district and um, we went out, out, what they call outside the wire, um, almost daily, probably six out of seven days on average, um, to meet with um, government officials or to um, meet with um, tribal and village um, leaders. Um, and even though on occasions we did go and, um, and have um, meals um, with, with a, a few select um, tribal leaders, it wasn't the same... Um, um, it wasn't quite as easy to engage with, with the community as it had been on my previous engagement, and there was because the um, the Taliban uh, threat there was much higher, that um, people were much uh, more uh, more reluctant to to engage for fear of reprisals. Obviously, uh, in an environment like Afghanistan, where there's military and security um, issues, you've you've got to bear in mind. Um, uh, you know, security that you don't give away certain things um, security-wise whilst doing that, but you should never ever promise something that you that you are not going to deliver, and you, that you're not a hundred percent certain that you can deliver, um, because these people hear it time and time again. Um, 
as as different um, countries and different um, NGOs or groups come through that you know we're going to do this for you or we're going to deliver deliver that. Um, people expose themselves, come forward because they think they're going to have a benefit. And the next minute they're they're heading off, um, leaving the people behind. Because quite often they they're putting either their lives, their families, or their um, village uh, or tribe at jeopardy by by forming partnerships with um, the the coalition who the Taliban, for example, for example in um, Afghanistan are against so you know they have to know that you're there for the long haul because um, as I've had told to me often it's okay for you you're going to go home but um, when you leave we're going to be we're going to still be here and um, that we may be the ones that um, that suffer because of our um, our partnerships or our, our cooperation with you you know a pretty big responsibility to the Australian government and the Australian people because we're spending you know, tens of millions of their dollars, and uh, you can't um, administer that, that money. You can't um, uh, ensure that it's going to the right place. Sitting in a, in a in a base, you have to go out there and you have to inspect it. And um, you you um, one of one of the things that the the Taliban do is uh, is is try to stop us doing that. And uh, but if we if we fold to that, then we'd never get anything done and we'd never be able to assist the, the people, which is the whole reason we're there for. There's always a risk, um, even regardless of, of, of what you put in place. Um, however, there's, there's no point being in places like Afghanistan if, if you can't go outside the, outside the wire or outside the bases to um, to actually um, meet with people, to actually assess where projects need to go, to um, even assess whether projects have actually been that you've paid for have been constructed and constructed in a uh, a suitable way. Working at a at a base with uh, coalition soldiers, uh, about seventy Australian soldiers, seventy Australian soldiers, and about thirty Americans. Um, Knowing that whenever I was going out outside the wire, that I'd either be in a a, a vehicle that um, was designed to, you know, um, survive any IEDs, and um, if if uh, as they call dismounted or by foot, always having a security detail around me, uh, I felt that the the security um, situation um, had been mitigated enough to, to be able to carry out my work. March last year I was um, taking part in um, a number of um, um, meetings or small shares with um, uh, the district government officials and also the um, some of the key um, tribal leaders and we were having a, a series of, of meetings. Um, about the the future of, of future projects that we we were looking to um, instigate. It was a Monday Monday morning um, when we were going to uh, go to the district um, um, government offices, which is uh, colloquially known as the the white compound in Chora. It's about a 700 metres away from the the base and. Um, Due to the narrowness of the roads and um, difficulty for um, turning vehicles around, um, almost exclusively we would um, go to these um, meetings uh, dismounted or on foot. And um, there was about three or four different routes that we could travel on from the base and uh, we would um, alter those, those routes. Um, continually so that we didn't obviously go on the same way. On this morning we went um, without incident and had a meeting for about um, two hours and um, during those meetings we, as a sign of trust, we always take off our ballistic vests and helmets and protective gear and sit with the um, those people that we're meeting with. Um, the meeting had finished and we then um, put our protective gear back on, our ballistic vests and helmets, and 
gloves and glasses, etc. And uh, we headed off back to the base. Um, on this occasion, we took the uh, the main road, which we um, only took on very rare occasions. More focused, I was in the middle of a group. We had 16 uh, soldiers around me, 16 American soldiers. I was in the middle of the group, um, protected by them. And I was more focused on the project, which had been some drainage canals uh, on the side of the road as I was taking photographs in order to put together for a presentation for senior Aussaid officials um, the following day. We got to a, uh, a period of open ground um, where the, uh, the village ended and it's about 80 to 90 metres from the open ground to the forward operating base. Um, we'd walked about 20 or 30 metres I think into that open ground and um, from, from behind a, a child, which I, I didn't see, a 12-year-old uh, child, had come down um, dressed all in white and he was armed with a, a suicide vest and uh, um, had a, a detonator in each hand and um, he managed to get inside what they call the security bubble, so inside the, the, the group of soldiers and came up behind me and when he was about three metres away from me he detonated the, the suicide vest that he was wearing and um, it, it, it blew up and uh, killed him and also uh, uh, critically injured um, four, uh, myself and three of the other US soldiers. I think I lost consciousness for a, a very short time after the uh, the blast occurred, but um, shortly after that, I was um, I was conscious and and aware that I was uh, on the ground and uh, I couldn't hear anything because my my hearing had um, my left ear the hearing had been um, destroyed, but on my right ear just from the actual. Um, last the, my hearing was temporarily um, affected. My initial thoughts were that um, that either myself or one of the soldiers had stood on a um, an IED because I hadn't seen the the um, child. The child was um, was killed instantly um, and uh, I and uh, the others were were critically injured but um, uh, Thankfully, all four of us survived the 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 blast, and um, um, two two of the uh, soldiers are um, are back at work, and um, myself and one of the other soldiers are still uh, recuperating from our injuries. The um, witnesses um, stated that, and there was also some video footage that the that once the child had sort of entered the inside the, got onto the road in, inside the, the security cordon that he started to run um, forwards towards me and um, uh, one of the other soldiers. And um, as, as he was running, he, he, he may have tripped or um, um, fallen. And um, he was at an angle to the ground when the explosion took place, which no doubt um, saved our lives because a, a, a large, uh, percentage of the blast went downwards into the the ground before it then came up and hit us as opposed to hitting hitting us directly um, from the vest to uh, to recover from such a, a blast is uh, both a uh, a physical and a psychological journey um, in in our um, um, in the in the blast that I was injured in, um, we were very fortunate that um, nobody uh, lost limbs, which is a very common um, uh, outcome of of IED blasts. And um, uh, the, all of us were were very severely injured. For example, I had um, um, almost sixty ball bearings from the that were in the bomb um, strike me. But yeah, physically, it's a uh, it's a very long road, and um, you know, it's not like a uh, a TV show or anything where someone uh, gets wounded and gets patched up, and you know, a week later they're uh, 
they're back in battle or back at home uh, doing the normal things. Uh, uh, quite often, uh, if uh, if if they do recover, they'll they may never go back to work. And you know, for at least two of us, we're you know, 14 months later, we're still uh, still not back at work and um, still working hard to be able to walk properly, to be able to um, do uh, some of the most basic um, things that you took for granted um, prior to uh, to this happening. I think one of the, uh, the biggest impacts um, is on the family and uh, it, it certainly I think in um, in our family, it, it, as, as it would in any family, it had a, a, a big impact um, on, on my wife and um, and our children, but but also the the extended family on on both sides. And um, in our case, we're fortunate. That I wasn't a young soldier with young children. My my um, two children are, are grown up. But even even um, even though they're adults, it still uh, has has a very big impact. To, you know, I guess in some ways, um, because I'd been to so many different. Um, Places overseas, and um, you know, uh, several war zones that um, they almost think you're indestructible, and I think it has a has a bigger effect on when they see how vulnerable you know that you really are, and and the effect that, that an injury or, or injuries in in my case uh, can have. A, my wife hasn't been back to work. Since that time, she's been my um, full-time carer and um, ferrying me around to the myriad of um, rehabilitation services and doctors and um, you know multiple surgeries, which have took you know almost 12 months. The last surgery I had was about I think about six weeks ago. When you go to a, a place like Afghanistan, you cannot help if you've got any sense of humanity in you, you can't help but be be touched by the circumstances of um, of the people, particularly children and and particularly uh, females in in there who who aren't um, given the same opportunities. In the areas where the traditionally Taliban strongholds such as um, Urzgan and Helmand Province, um, it's it's a it's a bigger battle and it's it's harder to see. Um, the the re, the results and it's a very conservative area, so you're not going to get changes as rapidly as you are in in more urban areas such as Kabul. Um, however, to, uh, I, one day I went um, unannounced um, to a to an area called Awi, um, which is uh, a reasonably remote area, where. Um, I believe the Dutch had started the construction of a school and, and uh, the Americans and the Australians had, had completed it. Um, so I turned up at this, um, at this village and this school totally unannounced um, and uh, went in and I was thrilled to see that there was three classrooms there, two of them with um, boys in it, but a very, very crowded classroom of perhaps 50 young girls were in, in that and you know to see those young girls up to the age of about 12, um, 6 or 7 to 12 um, learning and um, laughing and you know being engaged to me that shows that um, making that uh, situation permissive for them to do that is uh, is a huge gain and if you know even if only one or two of those can go on to have some education or have some influence and, and you know, because change is such a, a small incremental thing, in, especially in those conservative areas that um, you can never expect to, to happen in, in five years or ten years. And, but to, to make just a little bit of, of an effort and to make some, to see some tangible changes um, gives some hope but it's going to take a long time. Look, I, I think, I think it's, a, it's a, a, a very worthwhile cause. The Taliban were, were and are a, um, a, a terrible organisation who have no, um, no care or for, for the, the Afghan people. Um, their, their interest is, is um, totally uh, self-absorbed. And as such, um, I think the the um, 
the coalition going in and um, assisting the Northern Alliance to 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 rid the country of, of the uh, Taliban's a very uh, has been a very noble effort and. Um, although it's taken a huge toll on, on all countries that have been, been involved.